Well, good morning, church family. If you have a Bible, I would invite you to open it to Hebrews chapter number four. Hebrews chapter number four. My, uh, my mentor in ministry is, uh, is a guy who uh, taught me how to follow Jesus, taught me how to uh, serve in ministry. His name is Troy Hobson. Now, Troy Hobson doesn't mean much for you. You probably don't know him, but he was my youth pastor at Salem Heights Baptist Church, which is my home church in Laurel, Mississippi. As the apostle Paul was to a young guy by the name of Timothy, so Troy Hobson was to me. As a matter of fact, Brother Troy spent countless hours allowing me to live life with him. I got to see everything in his life. I got to see how he spent time daily with Jesus. I got to see how he shared his faith. I got to see how he loved people. I got to see how he reacted to different situations in his life. I got to walk with him and see what it looked like to follow Jesus in everyday life. As a matter of fact, I owe a lot of what I do in ministry and how I've grown in my faith to this guy by the name of Troy Hobson. Now listen, not even just me, there are countless young men who were discipled by Brother Troy and are now serving in ministry throughout the country. Uh, one of, one of the, you, you happen to have two of those people in your church. Uh, Troy Hobson was my youth pastor. Troy Hobson was also Corey Jeffcoat's youth pastor. So just to give you a perspective of the impact he's had on our state, two of those young men happen to be serving together. At least I like to consider myself still young men, um, happen to be serving, uh, together here at First Baptist Saltillo. Brother Troy, he, he never got married. Um, never had any kids, but he has certainly raised a lot of young men. As a matter of fact, my kids call him by one name, and that is Papa T. Now, many of my memories with Brother Troy are from time spent on the potty call bayou on the Pascagoula River in Van Cleve, Mississippi, on his houseboat. As a matter of fact, I was talking about his houseboat the other day with some other pastors in our area, and our associational mission strategist, Brian Tillman, actually has been to Brother Troy's houseboat. It is that uh, kind of famous. Now, I'm not talking about a boat house. Some of you uh, may may have one of those, or some of you may want to call it that. I'm talking about a houseboat. Now, there is a difference. It's not a place where a boat is stored or where a boat that someone uh, has that they live on. This is a two-bedroom, two-bathroom, kitchen and living room house that's floating on several pieces of styrofoam on the Pascagoula River. This is, in my opinion, the ultimate man cave. Now, when I was younger, even not even that much younger, Uh, We would jump off the deck at the houseboat, and uh, we would swim for countless hours uh, on on the river. We would tube and ski and wakeboard. We would fish and run all sorts of uh, fishing lines. And listen, even more than just the fun we had, we would read the Bible and talk about all things ministry and all things Jesus. We did a lot of things, a lot of awesome things, a lot of awesome stuff at the houseboat. I have tons and tons of great memories, and still to this day, it is my favorite place to study and prepare sermons. However, many of the days spent out the houseboat ended with long rides home from fishing. Some of you are those type of people who like to go fishing for a couple of hours, and if you haven't caught anything, then you go home. By the way, I'm one of those type of fishermen. This is not that type of fishing. This is the type of fishing where we would leave early in the morning, we'd ride down the river till we shot out into the Gulf of Mexico, and we would spend all day fishing, catching anything and everything that we could. Oftentimes I have people ask me, hey, what what were y'all fishing for? And my answer is always yes. Whatever it is, whatever we caught, that is in fact what we were fishing for. Now listen, don't tell Brother Troy, but most days, All of us that were on the boat with him were ready to go back to the houseboat by lunch. But if we left to go fishing, we were going to be out there until you could not see anything anymore. And as a matter of fact, it would still be that dark. And oftentimes we would still be fishing. And then we'd ride back up the river in the dark to get back to his houseboat. Now listen, it's about a 30 minute ride, sometimes more, depending on what we were in, to go out to the Gulf and then to come back up 
the river. Now, I tell you this because I can think of so many different times that I'd be sitting next to Brother Troy as he drove the boat back up the river. And listen, it would be so dark that I couldn't even see the people who were sitting in front of the boat, much less could I see where we were going. But Brother Troy always knew exactly where we needed to go. He could see what I couldn't see. He knew the river in ways that I didn't know the river. As a matter of fact, if you were the other guys on the boat with us that day, if I was the one driving us back up the river to the houseboat, everyone would have been terrified. But I was never scared because I knew that Brother Troy was the perfect river guide to get us back to the boat. Now, you might be thinking, Danny, why are you telling us about riding up the river in the dark? I, I understand. It's pretty simple. Because life can be a lot like that river in the dark. Life can be difficult to navigate. You say, Danny, what do you mean? Have you ever asked questions like these? What direction do I go? What decision do I need to make? Where is the danger that I can't see? It can be hard to see where to go next in this life. It can be so dark at times that we have no idea what's right in front of us, much less what may be up river. However, Jesus is the guide we need for navigating life. As a matter of fact, one of the most famous prophecies well known in the Christmas season about the birth of Jesus is found in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Here's what the prophet wrote. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. The Messiah will be born and his name shall be called or his name shall be described as these four phrases, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Now over the course of this next month, as we celebrate Christmas together, I want us to process through these descriptions of Jesus, these descriptions of the coming Messiah who, by the way, has already come. The first prophetic word used to describe Jesus is wonderful counselor. Now these two English words come from the Hebrew words Pele and Yoez. Now it's probably not pronounced Pele Yoez. That's the country Mississippi Danny version of the Hebrew language. So we're gonna pronounce it as Pele Yoez. Now Pele is the word for wonderful. It means a great soccer player. Ha ha ha, right? No, it really doesn't, even though I only thought about that because the U.S. could have really used Pele in the you know, World, World Cup re re recently. Sorry if that still hurts for some of you deeply. No, the word Pele, it means beyond understanding or too wonderful for words. It could be translated as extraordinary, astonishing, or miraculous. Now, now process that for a minute because when Isaiah went to describe the coming savior of the world, when he went to describe Jesus, the only word he could use was a word that meant he could not be described at all. He is too wonderful for words or beyond understanding. There's no doubt we, have, we don't have the adequate words in any language to really describe the greatness of Jesus. He is too wonderful. He is Pele for us to describe. Then there's the word yoez. This is the word for counselor. It means to advise, to consult, or to guide. You say, oh, Danny, guide, like Brother Troy on the rip. Oh, yeah, that type of guidance for our lives, right? What better way to describe Jesus' authority in the lives of those who have surrendered the, to him? He is the counselor. He is our advisor. He is our uh, savior. He is our great shepherd, our supreme authority to guide everything that we do. We go to the one 
who is wonderful beyond understanding to guide our every step, which by the way, we may not even fully understand. He is God in the flesh. He is the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. And yet he knows you and cares for you and knows exactly what you need and what you're going through so that he can be your Pele Yoez, your wonderful counselor. I read it like this recently in our Bible reading plan that we've been doing in Hebrews chapter number two, verses 17 through 18. Here's how the writer of Hebrews describes Jesus. He says, therefore, he had to be made like us, his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He is our great high priest, our savior, our shepherd, our guide, our wonderful counselor who has been tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. You know what the writer of Hebrews is trying to explain to us? He's trying to explain to us what the prophet Isaiah said several hundreds of years before this moment. He's saying that he's gone through what we will go through. He understands our burdens. He understands our lives. He understands Understands our hurts, regardless of what you're dealing with in life or what you will deal with in life. He's the wonderful counselor that you need and that I need to overcome everything. He is, as the writer of Hebrews put, merciful and faithful in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus came for the broken, for the needy, for the hurting. He came to be our ultimate river guide so that we could navigate this life. As a matter of fact, in the Gospels, we have an account that really describes what Jesus came to do. We find a guy by the name of Matthew who Jesus calls to follow him. Now, Matthew's a tax collector. We know about what that means. He's probably dishonest. He's probably a thief. He's probably the one person that nobody else wants anything to do with, but Jesus does. As a matter of fact, Matthew's so pumped that Jesus would come to him and ask him to follow him that he throws this huge party and he invites all of his other sinful friends to come and meet this guy by the name of Jesus. And when some religious leaders, some religious elitists who think they're better than everybody else hear about this party that Jesus is going to, they are highly offended. Why would Jesus hang out with these people? They didn't know how to dress right. They listened to the wrong kind of music. They watched rated R movies. They said bad words. How could Jesus ever be around these people? And so listen, they asked him. They said, Jesus, what are you doing with these people? Here's what Jesus said back to them in Luke chapter five, verses 31 through 32. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now listen, I've read this verse before and I've thought, is he saying they don't need him? That they're good enough? That they're religious enough? He didn't come for them, they're well. He came for those who are sick. Those are the ones that he's coming to serve. I don't think that's what he meant to them. As a matter of fact, later he'll call them things like vipers and fools. As a matter of fact, Paul will later write in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So I think it's safe to say that Jesus was telling these religious leaders, these elitists, that he has come for those who knew and were known to be sinners. He could only help those that knew they needed his help, not those who thought they did not. And so I thought to myself, What about us in the room this morning? Do we know that we're in need of a wonderful counselor? Are we willing to turn everything over to Jesus and let him be the one who guides our lives? Friends, what Jesus said in Luke 5 is true of every single one of us in this room. 
We are all sick. We are all in need of a physician. If you don't believe me, just think about the world around us. Depression, worry, anger, unforgiveness, bitterness, envy, materialism, worldliness, loneliness. The list could go on and on and on. Whatever it is that holds us back, whatever it is that's dominating the culture of this world, whatever sin you want to throw into those blanks, we need to remember that Jesus is our wonderful counselor and he is ready to guide us through the darkness of this life. He is our river guide. Now, I don't know about you, but I want this type of guide in my life. I need this type of guide in my life. And I know whether you're honest or not in this room this morning, you need that type of guide too. So how? How can we allow Jesus to guide us to be our wonderful counselor, our Pele Yoez, our ultimate shepherd and guide to this life? Well, I think the writer of Hebrews from a passage that we read this week in our Bible reading plan really gives us a glimpse into how we can live and walk in a way that Jesus will be our wonderful counselor. It's in Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to start reading in verse number 12. You go there. Let's read this this morning. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then, We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus, will you bless the reading of your word this morning? Use it so that we can live obediently to you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. You say, all right, Danny, you've told us about the river. You've told us about the wonderful counselor. You've explained this description of Jesus. Why in the world are we looking at Hebrews chapter number four? Well, the answer is simple. It's because I think the writer of Hebrews is showing us some things that we can do to allow Jesus, who, by the way, wants to be, longs to be our wonderful counselor. These are things we can do that allows him to guide us when we can't guide ourselves. You say, Danny, what do you mean? Well, here's the first thing I think he reminds us of, and it's just simply to be open. That's number one. Danny, how can Jesus be the wonderful counselor that I need in my life? Well, I think first of all, you've got to be open to him every single day. You say, what do you mean? Well, look back at Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. He says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now watch this, verse 13. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I'm reading this, and instantly it made me think of a recent encounter that we've read about in the Gospels. It's the encounter that we read in John chapter 4 when Jesus comes across a Samaritan woman. She's rejected by everybody in her life, friends, family, even strangers. She's looking for acceptance and love through different relationships that she'd been through, but all of them left her empty. She was now living with some man, trying to find her place in the world when she meets Jesus. And Jesus begins to talk with her, and she immediately tries to hide her life from him. Now, I don't know if many of you connect with this, but I certainly do. As a matter of fact, he goes on, he says, he asked her to go get her husband and she told him that she didn't have one. But Jesus knew all about her life and he lets her know about it. Here's what he told her in John chapter four, verses 16 through 18. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, here's Jesus, who by the way, no creature can hide from. This is what he says, you are right 
in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And you say, Danny, why are you bringing this up? Because I think she did what many of us try to do. She tries to hide her past from Jesus. She's like many of us in the room this morning. We will do the church stuff. We will pray the church way, and we will put on our smiles and act like we have everything together. But don't forget what the writer of Hebrews tells us. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You might act like you have everything figured out before me and everyone else in this room. But can I tell you something, friends? Jesus knows you. You can't hide from him. Why not? Why not just be honest and open with him about your life? He is the wonderful counselor who wants to guide us to the life that he wants for us. Listen, I've dealt with pride and the approval of men. What I need is not more approval from people, but guidance from Jesus. I've dealt with lust and passion what I need is not false fulfillment from sin, but guidance from Jesus. I've dealt with doubts. What I need is not more reliance on myself, but more guidance from Jesus. As a matter of fact, the psalmist speaks wisdom to us in Psalm 55, 22, when he wrote these words, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. The apostle Peter speaks wisdom to us when he follows that up in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Listen to me, friends. This life gets dark. Traveling up river is impossible on your own. Don't do it alone. You don't have to. Rely on Jesus. Cast your cares on him. Be open and honest, and he will guide you through the river of life, through the word of God that is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Can I tell you something, friends? I, I, I want Jesus to be the wonderful counselor for my life. Where do I begin? I begin by being open and honest before a God who knows everything about me, confessing that I don't know, but he does. Here I am. Will you? Be open to Jesus. Let me show you the second one. Not only be open, I think the writer of Hebrews reminds us to be observant. You say, Danny, what do you mean? Look back at verses 14 and 15. Here's what he wrote. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. By the way, what, what better high priest could we surrender to and follow than Jesus himself. He says, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Listen, once we are open with God, he will begin to reveal more and more to us if we will be observant to the things that he is doing around us and listen to his voice. I couldn't get away from this phrase that the writer of Hebrews said, let us hold fast our confession. In other words, don't forget who you belong to and who you should be looking for and listening to. There's a moment in the gospel accounts where God reveals who Jesus is. It's famously known as the transfiguration of Jesus. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus is literally glowing as God reveals him to be his son. As a matter of fact, some of the Old Testament greats even show up and they begin, according to Mark chapter 9 verse 4, they begin talking with Jesus, which by the way, I might would submit is better thought of as worshiping Jesus. And in this moment, God speaks down from heaven with a message to the disciples that were present in Mark chapter 9, verse 7. Here's what God says. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Now think about this. God could have said anything he wanted to say as Jesus is being shown to be God right there before their faces. But here's what he chooses to say. This is him. This is me. This is what you need. Listen to him. Wow, how much more simple can that get? <laughs> How many of us need to be smacked a couple of times every day when we do something ridiculous, when all we had to do was listen to Jesus? Can I tell you something, friends? 
He could be speaking to you through your time with him and his word and, and prayer. Why don't you be observant to what he's showing you? He could be speaking to you through other people in your life. I don't know what that might look like, but why don't you be observant to what he's trying to do? He could be speaking to you through worship, even today, through the songs that we sang that were magnifying him, or through the preaching that's magnifying him, or some other form of worship today. Why don't you be observant to what he's trying to show you? He could be speaking to you through some situation that you're going through right now that you don't fully understand. Matter of fact, in Sunday school this morning, my class decided instead of asking why something's happening, why don't we start asking God what he's up to in the midst of it, right? What if why gets thrown away and what becomes our question? God, I'm not so concerned with why that's happening. I just know that you're going to work this for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So God, what is it that you're trying to show me now? Man, he could be speaking to you through his Holy Spirit in any number of ways. Will you be observant to what Jesus is trying to tell you? Listen, Jesus put it this way in John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. You know something, friends? If my children call me, I know their voice. If Kayla calls me, I know her voice. If my mama calls me, I know her voice. We can train ourselves to hear Jesus clearly as we become more observant to what Jesus is doing around us. Since then, here's what the writer of Hebrews said, since then, we have a great high priest, a great shepherd, a wonderful counselor, a guide who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Listen, don't forget who you belong to. You should be looking for him and listening to him every single day. Since we've confessed Jesus as our Lord and Savior, look for him, listen to him, be observant. He's at work around you, in you, and through you. Do you even notice him? Let me show you this last thing, though. You say, Danny, how can Jesus be the wonderful counselor that I need? Well, what if you would be open? What if you would be observant? What if you would be obedient? Whew, I know this is where it always gets hard, right? It's like, all right, Danny, I can, I can be exposed before Jesus. No, no big deal. All right, I'll listen to him. I'll do my best. But wait a second. You mean even after I hear him or see him or I know what he wants to do, I've actually got to do it? Yes, you've got to be obedient. This is why the writer of Hebrews in verse 16 of chapter 4 said, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. By the way, listen, there's plenty of mercy and there's plenty of grace that we can find to help in time of need if we will with confidence draw near to Jesus. Once we've been open and observant, we must be obedient with what Jesus tells us. This is the progression and it always leads to us being obedient to, to, to action, to follow after Jesus. He's not just guiding us for us to know what's best. He's guiding us so we can be obedient and we can line our lives up with a better way, with his way. This is why I wrestled so much with this phrase this past week, let us then with confidence draw near. Listen, he knows everything about us, so why not just be open with Jesus? He's showing us things all the time as he's at work around us, and if we will be observant to what Jesus is up to, we can see something different. Will we even notice? And he's revealing all this to us so that we can be obedient, but don't miss this. We are the ones that need to draw near. He's always with us longing for us to be open and observe and be obedient. He's done all that we need and provides us with mercy and grace and guidance for life. Will we follow him? Will we be obedient? Will we draw near? You remember how James reminded us of this in James chapter four, verse eight, when he wrote these words, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your, your, your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Listen, God's done his part in providing salvation through Jesus. Will we do our part by obediently choosing to follow him? Now, don't mistake me. I'm not saying that this will be easy. Yes, all of this is simple, but I'm not saying that simple means easy. Matter of fact, being obedient to God goes against our very nature of sin and selfishness. And listen, there may even be times when we don't understand why God's telling us to do something, but obedience is still required. I think about one of the most famous moments in the Bible that I just don't know that I could have followed through with, that I don't know that I could have been obedient in, and it's the prophet Hosea. 
Here's what it says in Hosea 1, verse 2. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Now listen, I'm pretty sure in that moment, I would have had a few questions for God. Are you sure this is the right way? Are you sure this is what you want me to do? I'm pretty sure everybody around me is going to say this is crazy, but Hosea was obedient even when he may not have understood. Now, that's not my encouragement to you. (laughs) What about the rich young ruler in the Gospels who encounters Jesus? Matthew chapter 19, verses 21 and 22, Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Listen, Jesus wanted him to go against his own sin and selfishness, but he could not do it. Let me tell you something, friends. It's not easy. But being obedient to Jesus, though it may be difficult at times, is always the best decision we will ever make. Listen, without a doubt, this life can be hard to navigate. It can be hard to see where to go next. It can be so dark at times that we have no idea what's right in front of us, much less what might be upriver. Wouldn't it be helpful if we had a river guide? Well, friends, we do. Jesus is that guide that each of us need for navigating life. He is the Pele Yoez, the wonderful counselor. He wants to be your guide, and there is certainly no one better. You say, Danny, how can I do it? Well, here's what I would ask you this morning. First of all, I'd ask you, when's the last time you were open with Jesus? When's the last time that you were on your face before him saying, here's who I am, here's what I got going on, here's what I need, I am broken in need of you, I can't do it, Jesus, but you can. Matter of fact, you might be a Christian in here, you've been a Christian for longer than I've been alive, but it's been about that long since you've been open with Jesus, and you're wondering, why isn't he helping me in my life? Well, when's the last time you were open with him? Listen, maybe that's the call on your life this morning. Maybe he's trying to wake you up, stir something within you that seems like it's nothing but dust anymore, but he's trying, to, he's trying to bring that water back. He's trying to make it fresh again. Will you be open with Jesus this morning? Listen, maybe you need to be observant. Maybe you're like, Danny, I can't remember the last time Jesus said something to me. Here's what I would tell you. I bet he said something to you this morning. You just hadn't looked for him or listened to him. He's not gone. He's right where you left him. Maybe this morning he's pushing somebody to open up their eyes and start actually living this life, looking and expecting for Jesus to show you what's next. When's the last time you were observant to the things around you because they weren't about you, they were about him? When's the last time, friend? Matter of fact, I wonder who might be in here this morning and for the very first time, you've observed something you've never observed before. For the very first time, you've realized this openness is something you've never done. I wonder who might be here who's never given their life to Jesus and maybe today is that day. So here's what I tell you. Why don't you be obedient? Hey, friend, he's telling you to be open. Why don't you be obedient to him? Hey, friend, he's telling you you need to look for him more. You need to be more observant to what he's doing in your life. Hey, why don't you be obedient to him? He's telling you something you need to do, some way you need to follow, some way you need to go deeper, some way you need to serve, some person you need to reach out to, someone you need to pray for. I don't know what it is. Why don't you try something different today? Why don't you try obedience to Jesus? Listen, I don't know what he's saying to you, but can I tell you something? Isaiah wasn't just joking about him being a wonderful counselor. He wasn't just joking about him being a guide for your life that is beyond words. He is. You say, Danny, I need that. I know. Me too. Why don't you be open and observant and obedient to Jesus today so that he can lead you in ways that you never knew you could live on your own. Father, we love you. Thank you. Praise you. Jesus, you're awesome. God, this morning.